hello to everyone. And uh, yes, I'm a medical doctor and I'm a member of a clinical care team for COVID-19 patients at uh, Vilnius University Hospital. Our hospital is second largest hospital in Lithuania and uh, in, we care for around uh, 1 million uh, population in, in COVID situation and it's one third of the uh, overall Lithuanian populations. And in this area, we have 858 uh, patients diagnosed with COVID, and uh, that is roughly one half of the all Lithuanian patients. So uh, we have such some, some cases, and I would like to, to give you a short overview of the um, COVID situation from a hospital perspective at patient level. So um, uh, the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic in Lithuania was, was steep but not huge. Uh, from a uh, few cases per day, we went to dozens of cases per, per day in, in actually in a week. So uh, at the very beginning, we developed um, criteria for hospitalization, with, which uh, are reflected higher risk of severe, complication, severe complications or death of the COVID-19 patients. So uh, I could, could reflect uh, uh, three main, main groups of the indications for hospitalization. So absolute indication for hospitalization was hypoxia and um, uh, respiratory failure with high respiratory rate and oxygen saturation of less than 96%. And then we also have relative indications for hospitalization. So uh, first uh, group of relative indications uh, was related to uh, disease severity, and uh, that was the radiological signs of pneumonia, and also we consider lymphopenia as a significant uh, finding, and uh, the uh, sign that, that this, may, may, this patient may have severe complication or die from COVID. And uh, then we also have second group of uh, relative indications for hospitalization that was age over 50 years because from the initial data we have some impression that these patients have risk uh, of dying from COVID of uh, around 1%. So we consider that this risk uh, uh, at, at the like very high for, for, for patients who are 50 years of age. And also, uh, a relative indication was uh, younger patients uh, if they have uh, comorbidities, such as a cardiovascular pathology, diabetes, respiratory disease, or renal insufficiency. And uh, patients irrespective of age with uh, clinically significant uh, immune suppression was also selected for hospitalization. So in case there was detected absolute indications, patients were hospitalized without questions. And uh, if there was more than one relative indications, uh, usually these patients were also hospitalized, but this decision was um, at the discretion of the physician at the emergency department. So uh, clinical management of COVID-19 patients at our hospital. Diagnosis was majorly based uh, on PCR finding. Positive PCR was uh, the, the basis for this diagnosis, but also we uh, considered the radiology and the clinical symptoms. And if uh, there was suspicion for COVID-19, uh, uh, from clinical point of view, we usually attempted to to perform repetitive testing of PCR and usually um, performed even uh, bronchoscopy to, to, to get a specimen from, from directly from the lung to increase the performance of PCR testing. So treatment, as, as, as uh, most of us know, that there is no approved treatment for COVID-19 patients and uh, all hospitalized patients received the best supportive therapy as a standard of care. And the patients who met criteria for hospitalization and were considered high risk were able and willing to provide written informed consent were considered as a candidate for experimental treatment and experimental therapies. And I will, will uh, um, look a little bit in more details in this group of patients uh, in next slides. After the decision of medical advisory board, some of uh, candidates, so-called candidates patients or high-risk patients were offered not approved therapies or clinical trials. And we actually have three options. First, uh, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, uh, which is currently on hold after the decision of uh, WHO uh, and due to recent information published in Lancet. And then uh, also we uh, 
For some patients, we use convalescent plasma, and uh, currently the main option is participation in WHO-supported solidarity trial, uh, where we can use local standard of care, that is supportive care, versus lopinavir uh, versus remdesivir, and um, hydroxychloroquine is also in this trial on hold. So, and three arms in this clinical trial in Lithuania. A uh, basic characteristic of admitted to hospital patients, as you could see, three columns of information. First column uh, it, about all patients who were admitted, and second column reflects um, or uh, describes uh, high-risk patients who were able uh, to give written consent uh, for experimental therapies um, and uh, data collection, and not candidates. Uh, these uh, patients uh, were considered not candidates if they were at low risk, that means not met uh, hospitalization criteria, or were not able to give informed consent. Uh, so uh, this is a mix of low risk patients and actually very high uh, risk patients with end of the life state and uh, very severe clinical conditions. Uh, roughly three quarters of uh, not candidates patients uh, that was uh, low risk patients, uh, young patients in good clinical shape, and uh, about one quarter was patients in, in uh, uh, severe clinical condition or end of the life status. So uh, the median age was uh, 55 in overall cohort and uh, in the high risk cohort uh, it was 62. Uh, year of age, and interestingly, age uh, interquartile range was 51 to 73. That means that significant proportion of uh, high-risk patients were quite young, and uh, uh, we have high uh, rate of comorbidities in candidate. Uh, most of the candidate patients or high-risk patients have uh, significant comorbidities. And uh, high-risk patients also almost universally have pulmonary involvement on X-ray or computer tomography. Uh, outcomes, uh, hospitalization outcomes. So uh, median duration of hospitalization in our high-risk uh, cohort was 12 days. And uh, these were high-risk patients and the uh, interquartile range also was quite dense, so it's uh, between 10 to 14 days. And the majority, uh, majority of patients were discharged in two weeks. More than 75% of patients were discharged in two weeks. And uh, in non-candidates, as I uh, mentioned before, most of these patients were younger and low-risk patients, and the median duration of hospitalization was quite, quite uh, short. And uh, usually the reason for hospitalization in this cohort of patients was uh, not um, medical, but more social, logistic, or epidemiological. So uh, we discharged uh, already 81% of our patients, and uh, we have uh, ongoing 30 patients, and uh, overall 19 patients died at our institution. It's 7.3%. Interestingly, in the candidates group that were high-risk patients with pulmonary involvement, uh, with comorbidities, uh, we have just 2.9% mortality and overall 4 patients died. In not candidates group, I would say that uh, there was uh, quite uh, um, a big mortality among patients in end-life status and in very severe clinical condition who, who presented at our hospital in very severe clinical conditions. Uh, uh, admission to intensive care unit. Uh, we have 10% uh, of our patients overall admitted to intensive care unit, and median age was 59 years. So uh, half of the patients were quite young. Treatment duration, median treatment duration at ICU was 10 days, and this distribution um, has fat tail. So uh, we have, we have uh, quite um, a big proportion which stayed longer than, than median. And uh, this, this long duration extends to 65 days. And treatment, uh, uh, we discharge, we have already discharged 57% of our patients from intensive care unit. Interestingly, uh, uh, four patients were on ECMO, and one, one patient was salvaged by this procedure. 
And uh, overall, I think uh, like uh, just seven patients received mechanical ventilation. We used high flow masks uh, in, in majority of our patients at uh, intensive care units. And uh, the last slide uh, was about the clinical and real life performance of PCR testing. And uh, this I would, I may call a little bit disturbing because um, uh, classical way to discharge patient is to receive two uh, negative consecutive PCR tests and to, to discharge this patient to, to the society, to home. And uh, we were able to, to achieve this goal in 60 of our patients. I would like to remind that uh, 30 patients still are at hospital at 45%. It's including these 30 patients who are still at our hospital. And uh, uh, we discharged uh, 36 patients still positive on PCR and median time um, to discharge was two weeks. So uh, asymptom asymptomatic patients uh, who are actually um, getting better and, and uh, are clinically healthy still um, usually have positive PCR. And uh, uh, what is even more disturbing that uh, we have significant proportion of uh, conversion from negative to positive. We have 27 patients, which is 10% of all our patients who became positive after at least one negative test. And we also saw patients who became positive after two consecutive negative tests. And we also have quite a big patients, uh, it's not that so big, just eight patients, but uh, with multiple positive to negative conversions. And uh, also, there were six patients with the PCR positivity extending to more than one month. So that was the last of my slides. Thank you.